That's, that's quick thinking. She'd throw a tithe joke in on you guys. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that a lot. Hey, before we get going, um, I just want to share something. We have uh, a guest that's with us. Stephen, I didn't tell you we were going to announce you, but uh, up here in the front, we've got a guy named Pastor Stephen Yos, and uh, he's in from the States just visiting uh, Casey and I and um, hanging out in Cape Town. And if you want to know anything uh, embarrassing or funny about Casey, then you can talk with him after the service. He's known Casey probably longer than I have. Uh, Stephen also did our wedding, so he, he did Casey and I's wedding, and he's also known Lifa longer even than I have. He was around when Casey first um, uh, started parenting Lifa. So, guys, I know you guys will make him feel welcome after the service, and he will tell embarrassing stories. So, um, But I'm excited to be here this morning. Because this morning we get to talk about something that I think is really, really special and I think is, is maybe under-talked about or underutilized. And we're in a series called Overflow. And today, part three, I've got a really uh, easy message title for you. It's We All Need a Fresh Start. We all need a fresh start. And that means something different to everybody. Uh, everyone kind of starts from a different place. And when you hear the words, we all need a fresh start, you may think about like your diet. Like, you know, I like to joke about, you know, there's always Monday to start a diet. I'll start on Monday and then you blow it on Tuesday and then there's the next Monday and you think, God, I just need a fresh start in that. Maybe relationally or it may just even be with the way that you think about yourself, the way that you identify with yourself. But what I want to do is I want to kind of unite us and bring us all together and the first thing I want you to understand is that you guys are really, really loved. I don't think that we understand how loved we are. I don't think that we really know how much God loves us. See, God's love for you is bigger and more amazing than you can ever understand. See, this is my burden for you on a Saturday night when I pray about this service happening, about all of you coming on Sunday morning. I pray, Lord, let them experience the abundant love that you have for them. And I, and I pray for you guys on Sunday mornings, and we developed a, a pastoral care team, a prayer team, and they get together on Sunday morning before the service to pray over the service because we want you to know that you are really, really loved. Now, outside of these doors and outside of this building, there may be nothing in your life that's telling you how loved you are. But here in this place, we want you to know that you are really, really loved. Now, God's love is so powerful, and it's made evident to us, and it's, it's proven in the fact that Jesus came, He walked this earth, He died, He was buried, He resurrected, and He went up into heaven, He gave us the Holy Spirit. It's through the power of what He did that we can claim this as an undeniable truth. Now, that love is made possible to us by this thing that's called grace. Now, grace is, is this amazing thing. I would like to think that, that I'm a grace forward person. And we are a grace forward church. See, we, we believe that God's grace just covers all of us. See, God's grace is so amazing and so powerful. This is the thing that allows you to be forgiven. This is the thing that when Jesus died on the cross for you, we were extended grace. And that grace is a gift that we don't deserve. That's what makes it grace. But he covers us with it. And grace is something that, that anybody, no matter where you are, if you're brand new here, if you don't know Jesus, maybe you hate Jesus. Maybe somebody just dragged you here, or, or for whatever reason you're here. Or if you've been saved for a hundred years, this grace is the same for all of you. This grace covers you. This grace allows your sins to be forgiven. And see, grace is such an amazing thing that did you know that there is actually a problem with grace? There's a real problem with grace. Auntie Sheila, did you know great, there's a problem with grace? She's like, this boy is preaching the wrong gospel. <laughs> now, let me explain it to you. The problem with grace is this, that grace is so good. It's so wonderful. It's so powerful that it takes all of us and our messed up lives, and it makes us look like we've got things together. See, no matter how much I've sinned, no matter how much of a wreck I am during the week, when I come in here on Sunday mornings and I get on stage with you guys, you guys don't know how crazy the week has been. It doesn't matter because the, the last thing I pray before I come out here is that God would cover me with His grace. And that through God's grace, something would be delivered to you that would mean something to you, that would impact your lives, that would lead you to accepting a truth about Jesus that maybe you had not accepted before. And that's just me. See, God covers all of us with grace. And so, so many of us, we, we, we walk around and, and what happens is that we think we're the only ones with a problem. 
you think to yourself, I'm the only one addicted to pornography. I'm the only one that's addicted to, to spending money. I'm the only one that struggles with pride and envy. I'm the only one with a messed up past. I'm the only one with a messed up secret life that I continue to live. Let me look around. Yeah, everybody in this room seems fine. Everybody here seems wonderful. This person's got their life together. This person was very friendly and happy. I see this group over here. They're talking to each other, shaking hands, having coffee. Everything looks wonderful. But my life's a wreck. And see, this problem with grace is that grace is so good, it covers us. It cleanses us. But it can also make us look like everything is great. Now those of us that tap into grace, it's true. No matter how messed up your life is, you are made new. And you are great. You are wonderful. You are loved. But those that haven't tapped into grace, those of you that haven't tapped into it, that are carrying around the secret sin or the secret past or the dark spots in your heart, and you think that you're the only one that has it, you need to know that everyone in this room, the person on the left and the person on the right of you, is only here because of God's grace. You are only here because of God's grace. It covers you all. So this is a place where there are no secrets. There's no secret sin. There's no secret darkness in your life. You're not the only one that's addicted to what you're addicted to. You're not the only one that craves what you crave. You're not the only one that's mean the way that you're mean. You're not the only one. Everyone in this room is just as messed up as everybody else. Now, speaking about messed up, I don't want to get in trouble with, for this, but I am. I see that my wife has gone out of the room, so I can say whatever I want to say. There's this thing about ugly babies, okay? Everyone's laughing. Listen, some of y'all got some ugly babies. You know, yes, thank you. So I just want to say that, that one of Casey's friends, who I know doesn't watch the service, so this is fine. I can't remember her name, but what I do remember is she's got the ugly baby. <laughs> so Casey would, would, would say she's doing things and she's going to meet with somebody about, oh, is that the one with the ugly baby? And she'd be like, you can't say that. You can't say that. But listen, you got, this is, this is true. There's beautiful babies, my two, they're beautiful. And then there's, then there's ugly babies. You know, ba babies are, 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 are this perfect like, model of grace. Because guess what babies do? Babies do nothing. They contribute nothing to you. They don't pick kids up from school. They don't put petrol in the car. They don't cook dinner. They don't clean. They do absolutely nothing. And yet, even though they do nothing for you, we rearrange our lives around them and we love them. And we do everything that we can for them. We want to make them safe. We want to make them feel comfortable. We want to make sure that they're fed. I, I remember looking at my wife when we just had, had Benjamin, the jam man. And he was young and Casey's wanted another one. And I'm like, no. And there were moments where Casey's like covered in food. She's sitting on the floor. Benjamin's throwing a fit. And I'm like, you want another one? We can't deal with one. We can't deal with this. We're not going to make another one. And it took me two years to finally say, fine, we can have another one. And, and why it's great, why it's easy. But, but babies, they just consume. And, and, and they, make it, they make it hard because they don't contribute anything back to you. Yet, every parent in this room would do absolutely anything that they could do for their child or for a baby. Or even for someone else's child. I can't even watch movies or TV where there's a baby involved. I can watch a movie, and it's the second a baby comes up, and I know there's going to be drama around that baby, it's going to be unsafe. Or something. I'm like, nope, watch something else. Because I can't help but identify that baby with my own baby, with my own child. Now, see, th this thing about babies, it, it, it leaves me thinking about grace. Because we, we are the ugly baby. We, we are babies in God's eyes. We are. See, what do we contribute? What do we contribute to the kingdom? Nothing. When you're born and you enter this world, before you give your life to Jesus, what do you contribute to God's kingdom? Nothing. We sin. We reject God. We walk away from God. We turn our, our eyes away from God. We choose things to fill a hole in our heart that we know is God-shaped, yet we fill it with something else. We don't contribute. We don't help clean up other people's lives. 
We're, we're sinners. We're born that way. And yet, even though we're born in a way that we can't contribute anything to the kingdom of God, God still has grace for us. Because He still, like a parent would, like we do for our kids, God does for us. He wants us protected. He wants us well fed. He wants us well clothed. He wants us well taken care of. He wants us well loved. And He would do anything in the world for us, despite our sin. Right? Even though we're sinners, God does it for us. This is a picture of what grace looks like. This is an amazing, beautiful picture of a heavenly father that went so far as to sacrifice his son for us. Now, I want to show you this in Scripture. There's, there's two passages we're going to look at in Romans. And Paul is writing this. And this is just a perfect illustration of what the Bible says about this model of grace that we're talking about. It says here in Romans 5.8, But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us. So God shows his love. He proves his love for us. By the fact that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. This is, this is where we're an ugly baby. While we're still ugly babies, Christ died on the cross for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what grace looks like. Let's go to another verse. Let's look at it again here. This is also Paul talking in Romans 3, and he says this. Since all, so that's everybody, so if you feel like you're an island, like you're the only one carrying around a secret dark sin or a secret addiction, you're not the only one. Since all, everyone, have sinned and continually fall short, meaning we never stop falling short. There's nothing you can do to stop falling short of the glory of God. So since all of that is true then this is what, what God and Jesus does. We are being justified, declared free of the guilt of sin, made acceptable to God, and we're granted eternal life. That life, it's a gift. It's a gift by His precious, undeserved grace through the redemption, the payment for our sins, which is provided in Christ Jesus. See, all, this, all these words explain to us that grace was a gift for us. We don't deserve it. We didn't do anything for it, but it was given to us. I've got an easy way for you to remember grace. It's an acronym here. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's it. Yeah, I came up with this all my own. <laughs> didn't take it from anybody. I am this smart. No, that's not true. Isn't this wonderful? God's riches. His heaven. His love. His forgiveness. God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus died for us so that we can have that. Now there's another way that we can look at grace. There's another kind of angle to grace and Paul also illustrates this for us and I will quickly go through it. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8, this is Paul and Paul's got this, this kind of thorn in his flesh and there's lots of speculation about what it is but we don't really know. But Paul's got this thing that he just can't get over and it bothers him and he keeps asking Christ asking God to, to, to get rid of it for him. And he says in verse 8, it says, Concerning this, so the, the thorn that's in his flesh, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. He's asked God three times. God, let this leave me. Take this from me. How many of us have been in our, if you've been around a long time, you know that I talk about the bathtub moment where, where, you're, where you're just in the bathtub, putting your head under the water, trying to escape the world, asking God for help, and you can't understand why God doesn't give you help. How many of us have been there? Just like Paul, three times I said, God, where's your grace? Where's your grace? Why don't you help me? Why don't you take this from me? And then his answer is this. His answer is, but he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, which means my loving kindness, my mercy are more than enough, always available, regardless of your situation. And then he goes on to say in the next part, he says, For my power is being perfected and is completed, and it shows itself as most effective in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weakness. This is Paul saying, okay, then I'll be proud of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. So some of us, we're looking for God to take something off our plate. When instead, God is looking for you just to take on a dose of grace. We're saying, God, take this from me. If there's something in your life that you're saying, why doesn't God take this? Why doesn't he remove this from my life or from my plate? I just, I just want you to think about and wonder, could it instead be that God is saying, I have grace that is sufficient enough for you. All you have to do is allow it. 
Now we see this more as we look at Paul's scriptures. And in fact, Paul is known as the Apostle of Grace. 100 times, actually over 100 times, Paul writes about grace in his writings. Paul wrote a good chunk of the New Testament. And over 100 times he speaks about grace. Now, if you take all the other authors of the New Testament, all the other books in the New Testament, and you put all of them together, grace is only mentioned 55 times. So when you have all these other authors combined, mentioning grace 55 times, and then you have Paul, the apostle of grace, mentions it over 100 times. Yeah, why is that? See, I love asking questions like, why? The Bible's okay to question. It's okay to ask, well, why do you say that? Why is it that way? Because there's, there's a great meaning in there, and we can find that. See, Paul, Paul was the apostle of grace, and the reason that he was the apostle of grace is because Paul had this broken past. See, Paul's past, it it didn't start out as he was the most powerful missionary that went out and took the word to the Gentiles, which is the non-Jewish people. Paul started out actually with a stoning. And he started out being present at a stoning of a man named Stephen. And Stephen was the first martyr, meaning Stephen is the first guy documented in the Bible that died post-Jesus because he was following the way, which, which was kind of what they said was Christianity at the time. The way was the movement that was following the Messiah Jesus. So Paul had this broken past. But let's read here. I'll show you. I'll put you in the scene where Stephen is at. And we find that in Acts chapter 7. And it says in verse 57, But they shouted with loud voices. So Stephen is, 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 is being surrounded by the, the, the Pharisees and by people, and Paul is there, and they've surrounded him, and they're shouting with loud voices. Just imagine yourself, this humble man named Stephen, and you've got all this going on around you, and you know you're about to be stoned. And they covered their ears, and together they rushed at him. They considered him guilty of blasphemy. Then they drove him out of the city and began stoning him. And the witnesses placed their outer robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They were throwing rocks so hard at him that they had to take their jacket off. They needed more flexibility. So they put their robes at the feet of Saul. And then we hear in in, in chapter 8, verse 1, this is what Saul says about this moment. Saul says, or it says that Saul wholeheartedly approved of Stephen's death. And on that day... A great and relentless persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. See, this is Saul's starting point. Is that he was part of the murder of Stephen. Then after this, Paul goes on and he sets out to actually devour the way. So as Paul's ministry begins to unfold, he wants to take the way, which is the movement of of those that are following Jesus. Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus identified that. So they called themselves the way. And so Paul says, I'm going to go out and I'm going to absolutely devour this thing. I'm going to put it to death. I'm going to take it. I'm going to just squash it. And I have to do that because as a Jewish man in our culture and, and the religion that we follow, which is the right religion of Christianity, it's, it's what we wouldn't consider it today. But they're following the Old Testament and they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And those that did believe, they wanted to just get rid of them, devour them. And we see that in in Acts chapter 8, verse 3. Paul then goes on. We see another picture of Paul. But Saul, which is Paul prior to his encounter with Jesus, he began ravaging the church and assaulting believers. He's, He's physically assaulting them. He's entering house after house and dragging off men and women, putting them in prison. This is a serious dude. This guy is is serious about squashing the religion. He's serious about taking care of these people and just, just absolutely destroying the movement of the way. And then in, in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Paul takes it to another level. And so while he's still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord and relentless in his search for believers, he then goes to the high priest. The reason he goes to the high priest is he wants to make sure that he has the backing of the high priest, which is like the law which is what ended up putting Jesus on the cross, he wants their support. 
So then Paul, he goes to the high priest and he asks for support. And he says, hey, give me letters of authority that, that I can take to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he finds any men or women there belonging to the way, men and women alike, he could arrest them and bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Paul is going to go and he's going to arrest everyone following the way and he's going to bind them up and he's going to then bring them back to Jerusalem and throw them in jail or have them killed. That's his plan. So Paul goes on this thing. It's like a crusade. It's like this. He has this crusade-like motivation. And he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to leave Jerusalem and go to Damascus. That's 200 kilometers of walking. You know, here in Cape Town, we don't want to drive 10 kilometers to go somewhere else. Can you imagine walking 200 kilometers? That takes motivation. I'm going to walk six, seven days to take care of these people, to put them in jail, to bind them up and bring them another 200 kilometers down. That, that's how seriously Paul wants this to happen. So, this amazing thing happens to Paul, and many of us know this story. Paul then, at this moment, he's on his way to Damascus, and he has this encounter and this encounter he has with Jesus, it, it kind of, it stuns him. It takes him aback. And while he's on the road, we can read here the encounter that Paul has with Jesus. In verse 4, Acts 9, verse 4, remember Paul is seething, he's mad. He said, I'm going to get those Christians. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to put the way to, I'm going to just lay it to waste. I'm going to tackle it. I'm going to devour it. It's going to be no more. I'm going to bind them up, bring them back to Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, he falls to the ground because he hears a voice from heaven saying to him, Saul, Saul. Now, anytime you hear Jesus or a voice from heaven repeat a word, then it means it's serious. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting and oppressing me? Jesus confronts Saul with all that he's done. It's not, hey, Saul, why are you addicted to lying? Hey, Saul, why are you addicted to pornography? Hey, Saul, why are you envious of your neighbor? No, it's, hey, Saul, why are you persecuting and oppressing me? This is a big deal. What Saul's doing is a big deal. And right there, Saul is struck blind. He loses his sight. And uh, Saul ends up traveling for another three days to Damascus. And then he's sitting in Damascus blind. And I like to imagine Saul sitting there praying because he does pray to God. And he's praying. He's saying, God, what is wrong with this here? Why, why am I blind? What happened to me? He maybe doesn't understand. He's like, I'm doing the thing that's right. I'm doing the thing I'm supposed to do. I'm protecting the church. I'm protecting our religion. I'm protecting our culture. I'm preserving the history so that it can move forward into, into the future. Why am I blind? And this guy, uh, Ananias, this poor soul... Just a random dude hanging out in Damascus. God comes to him in a dream and says, Ananias, guess what? There's this guy named Saul. You need to go and pray for him. And by the way, when you do, he'll be healed. Ananias says, nope. Nope. Not going to happen. See, Ananias knew that Saul was there to kill people, to imprison people, to take people to jail. And he's blind, which is great. Now all the Christians are walking around like, you can't see me, Marco Polo. You know? <laughs> Saul's just trying to figure out, you know. And Ananias, God says, no, 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 I want you to go. And he actually tells Ananias, I have chosen him. So stop complaining and go. And so Ananias goes and he lays hands on him and he prays on, over him. And then Paul, his, his vision is restored. It says scales fell from his eyes and Paul could see. And then that was a moment where Paul experienced a change in his heart. See, how good is it that we serve a God that won't let us continue down a destructive pathway? How good is it that we serve a God that won't let you continue to do the wrong thing? How good is it that we serve a God that is willing to step in when we're in the middle of something that we shouldn't be in the middle of? See, this is a moment in Paul's life where Jesus stepped in. Jesus stepped in to Paul's life. And it created life change for him. How, you know, I'm telling you right now, all of you out here, Jesus will step into your life. And when Jesus steps in, when he interrupts your life, sometimes it's great and it's wonderful. 
Sometimes Jesus steps in, you open up the email, somebody, you know, put money in your bank account, or, or Jesus, it's like, that's what we think about. Lord, step in, heal my kids. Lord, step in, extend my paycheck. Lord, step in and, and help me just, help, let my friend come and apologize to me. But I just want you to remember, when Jesus stepped into Paul's life, he made Paul blind for three days. See, we don't want to ask Jesus to step in if we know he's going to blind us for three days. That's not fun. Jesus, I want you to step in, but don't blind me, don't mess with me, don't touch me, don't hurt me, don't take anything away from me. We can then go through a list of parameters that we want to put on Jesus. But I'm telling you, Jesus is such a good God that he will step in. And because Jesus stepped in on Paul's life, something more amazing came out of it than, than he ever thought possible, than, than ever could think possible. So I just want to issue to you, just could you think about your life right now? And could you see that even though that things don't feel right, even though you think you're doing the right thing and you're up against hardship, could it be possible that Jesus is trying to step into your life? He's trying to interrupt you, to pause you, to redirect you. Because after Jesus stepped in on Paul's life, guess what? He went immediately from persecuting to preaching. Immediately. It says it in the Bible. Immediately. Paul immediately went from persecuting to preaching. So he's in Damascus. And Paul immediately gets up and he starts preaching. Goes into the temple. He starts preaching about Jesus. Preaching about the way. So now he's for them and he's on their side. And then Paul, he does that for a while. And then he's like, okay, I need to go back down to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem sent me up here to arrest people. But now I need to go down there and take to them what God has done in my life. And so Paul, in, in Acts 9, he, he goes back down to Jerusalem. And he's going to go down to Jerusalem, and he's going to preach to them, and he's going to talk about what Jesus did in his life. And so let's read that here. In Acts 9, Paul is heading back down to Jerusalem. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tries to join the disciples. Paul shows up, and he's like, hey, hey, I'm one of you. We're good, right? All's good. But they were all afraid of him because they were not believing that he was really a disciple. They're like, no, this guy is tricking us. He's, wearing, he's trying to lure us into something. No, they refuse him. So how's Paul going to write the majority of the New Testament? How's Paul going to be the apostle of grace when he can't even get accepted into this group of disciples? How is Paul going to take God's grace where Jesus stepped into his life and then take that to the disciples and influence the church of the entire world and then even influence the way we do church today. How's that going to happen? Well, the answer to that is two words. However, Barnabas. Barnabas is a guy that we're going we're gonna to unpack who he is. And, and we're going to end on Barnabas here. See, Paul goes to the, to the disciples. I'm one of you guys. Let me tell you about what God did for me. And they rejected him because they were afraid of him. However, Barnabas... Watch what happens in the scripture here. In Acts 9, 27. However, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. So Barnabas says, okay, Paul, come with me. Grabs Paul, says, I'm going to vouch for you. I'm going to take you, and I'm going to take you to the apostles. And what he does when he goes there is he described to them, go, go back a verse for it. He, he, uh, he describes to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road to Damascus. So he vouches for him. He says, hey, Saul, Saul, Jesus, on the road to Damascus. And then he goes on for the rest of the verse. And he says, and how he had spoken to him, and how at Damascus Saul had preached openly and spoken confidently in the name of Jesus. So, so Barnabas is, is telling the disciples, this guy's the real deal. I saw him preach about Jesus. I saw him talk about God. I saw that he is changed. I saw that he is different. Tell you what. He is one of us. And then based on Barnabas' word, guess what? They took Paul in. So why, the question is, is why does Barnabas have so much influence? Why does Barnabas have so much influence? And this is the part that gets me excited. We're about to learn something. Are you guys ready to learn something? You're not ready. Yes. <laughs> Do you guys want to learn something? See, this is the part where it's going to help you. Everything leading up to this and the message has been a lead up to this moment because you needed to understand how messed up Paul was. 
You needed to know how good God's love was. You needed to know how good His grace was. You needed to know that Paul was this horrible person, probably worse than any of us in the room combined. And Paul had an encounter with grace, and that grace changed his life, but no one would accept what grace had done in Paul's life. You needed to know all of that. So that now when we introduce Barnabas, we can say, why was there so much influence in Barnabas? Well, I'll tell you why. Barnabas uh, was actually a guy named Joseph. And we'll look here in Acts 4. L- listen to what Barnabas does. This is so easy to miss. When you're reading the Bible, you could just, you could just skip right over this. Just skip, 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 and not, put, not connect the dots. But let me connect the dots for you here. Joseph, who's Barnabas? So Barnabas isn't even his real name. Jo- and if you're reading ahead, don't read ahead. Wait on me, okay? <laughs> you're gonna... So Joseph, a Levite. A native of Cyprus who was surnamed Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. Barnabas was given the name Barnabas by the apostles. His name was Joseph. Hey guys, I'm Joseph. The disciples, hey Joseph, we're the disciples. Cool. Then Barnabas does something and they say, wait a minute, we can't call you Joseph. What you've done is so great, we're going to call you the son of encouragement. Barnabas' name meant son of encouragement. And what happened to inspire this encouragement, to inspire the disciples to do this, is guess what? It does involve money. Barnabas, he sold a field belonging to him, and he brought the money, and he set it at the apostles' feet. See, Barnabas used encouragement and generosity. Barnabas is the son of encouragement. And see, Barnabas, as the son of encouragement, he makes way for grace. Because remember, Paul was carrying God's grace, and he was shut out by the apostles. But Barnabas' encouragement and generosity made way for the grace that Paul was carrying from God to spread to the apostles. See, it's, it's this encouragement where Barnabas says, no, I vouch for him. No, I saw him. He is amazing. He's speaking truth. He, he's, Paul is the, he, he's the real deal. And he's lifting up Paul, and, he, and that's the encouragement side. The generosity side is this guy, you know, I don't know how much land he owned. Maybe he owned a ton of land, or maybe he owned just one little piece. But he's watching the apostles, and he's watching them work, and he knows that they have a need. And so he sells his land, and he takes all the money. He could have done anything he wanted to with it, but he takes it, and he puts it at the apostles' feet, and he says, here, this is for you guys. And it was such a significant gift to them, which leads me to think, where were they when they received this gift? Probably they really needed something. They probably really needed money. They probably were at the bottom of their barrel. They probably were desperate. But they were trusting. They were saying, God, we put our faith in you. And now, all of a sudden, Barnabas shows up, and he drops a bag of money at their feet. And they're like, man, you're a life changer. You just changed our lives. You've changed the trajectory of where we're headed. Your generosity and your encouragement. We've got to change your name. We've got to call you the son of encouragement. And then it makes way for grace. See, I just want you guys to know that today, encouragement and generosity, they continue to make a way for grace today. This is the lesson that I want you to learn today. This whole message comes down to these two points right here. We have the ability to tear down or we have the ability to build up. We have the ability to correct We have the ability to criticize. We have the ability to to put people where we think they should be. And we have a history that backs up that we've done that for all of humanity. Or with the same mouth, with the same lips, the same tongue, but a different heart, we have the ability to encourage. We can speak life into each other. You know, all of us that come in here this morning and I say, hey, do you really know what it means to be loved? You know, there's, there's a bunch of people that we could say, yeah, theoretically, I know that we're loved by God. You know, absolutely. But you know what? When I walk out of here and Monday happens, I don't feel God's love. You know what? People need some encouragement. And generosity, you know, we can give. I mean, I think about the Be Rich campaign. And if you're new here, we gave over 40,000 rand to, to the local Red Cross Children's Hospital Trust. That's generosity. That makes a way for grace today. See, what we've got to understand is that the brokenness of our world needs more grace. Our world is more broken than, than I think maybe it's ever been. 
politically, economically. I mean, there's stuff going on that's just crazy. It's a, we live in a broken world. Sin hurts sin. P- hurt people hurt people. The brokenness of our world needs grace. Generosity and encouragement open the doors for grace in our world. Now, I want you to share a burden that I have. I love the fact that we've got a full room today. It's great. You guys are a great church. You guys are amazing people. Casey and I, we love you so much. We do. Sunday is my favorite day. I, I, I love Sunday because I get to come and I get to interact with you. And today we're going to have volunteer appreciation afterwards. And that's just going to be so fun and so amazing. We love this. But you know what? I'm not satisfied with just you. I'm not satisfied with this room. Because there's still another person out there that doesn't know the grace of God. There's another person out there. We live in a city of 4 million people. Can't be happy with 200. I'm happy about you being here. But I believe that there could be more. So here's what I want to ask you is let us refuse to be satisfied. Let us, be, let us refuse to be satisfied with the level of brokenness in our society. See, I, I want us to be bothered and moved by the number of people that need Jesus. When we as a church become bothered and moved by the number of people that need Jesus, that need Jesus' grace, that need Jesus' love, then guess what we can call ourselves? We can call ourselves a Barnabas church. And as a church, we can go out and we can be generous. And as a church, we can go out and we can be full of, of encouragement. See, see, I believe that we are a Barnabas church. We, we are this. The grace of Jesus is on display in this church. I know people, I'm looking at you right now in the audience. I know people that are only here because of the Barnabas attitude of generosity and encouragement by others that has made a path for you to be here today. Let's be a Barnabas church to the rest of the city. Guys, can we have, can we have a thousand people, 500 people, a million people? Like, can we just never be satisfied? Because we're broken and we're burdened for those of, of, of the, the people that aren't in here or they're not plugged into a church somewhere else. I love meeting people and, and they hear I'm a pastor of South Point and I, you know, I talk to them and, and they're like, well, I don't really don't know that I would relate. I'm like, I don't care if you come to this church, just go to church. Just get in somewhere. Let me help you find a place. Guys, I want us to be a Barnabas church because I believe that we already are. But I believe that we're coming up on a season where we're further stepping into it. We are becoming more of a Barnabas church because we are a church of encouragement and generosity. And we're learning to encourage more and we're learning to be more generous. Yeah, I get the opportunity to hang out with the volunteers and especially this new team that we have, the pastoral care team. They do everything that they do is for you. And they have a heart for you. They have a heart of encouragement and a heart of generosity for you. Did you know that, that in the, the same month, I've said this before, but in the same month that we gave over 40,000 rand to Be Rich, it was also our, one of our biggest tithe months. That means that you guys are a generous church. See, we are generous. We are full of encouragement. Let's concentrate that and let's go out and let's change our city. Now, I want to give you something practical. See, everyone can start somewhere and with something. Everyone has a starting place with encouragement and generosity. What what I'd like for you to do this week is I'd like for you to set up, set one alarm on your phone. Set one alarm and title that alarm encouragement and have it repeat for six days, for seven days. And on that alarm, when that alarm goes off, maybe it's at two in the afternoon, maybe it's whenever, But when that alarm goes off, I want you to send one encouraging message out to somebody. I promise you it'll change your life. It'll change their life, but it'll also change your life. You know what I love to do when I'm feeling like down and depressed? When I'm feeling like low? When I feel the worst? What I love to do is I love to open up WhatsApp on my computer. And I love to just go down all my WhatsApp messages and just tell people how great they are. Because you know what? When I feel low, it means my heart is soft. And I can identify with somebody else feeling low. And I just, I just love people. Hey, I just want you to know I love you. Hey, I just want you to know how valuable you are. And as I do that, you know, I get emotional and God moves in my life. And that encouragement that I give out to others, it then doubles and triples back to me. And I find myself picked up. I find myself different. 
Set your alarm this week. This week, every day, send one encouraging message to somebody. And practically for generosity, if, if you want a place to start with generosity, then start with a tithe. Maybe you do tithe, maybe you don't. But if you don't, I would love to invite you to it. See, Barnabas took his tithe. It wasn't his tithe. He took the money that he made from selling his, his land, his field, and he took it to the apostles' feet because the apostles were building the kingdom of God. They were building the church. And so you can bring your tithe to the, to the feet here at this church. And the guarantee for my, that I can make as a church is we spend it to build the kingdom. We spend it so that we can have another building, another campus, another service. We spend it so we can take care of, of those that are here, those of us that are in this room. So practically, this week, I want you to be an encouragement to somebody. I want you to find a way to be generous. If you already tithe, then go another step. Be generous. Be generous somewhere else. Pray and ask God. God, point out somebody to me that I can be generous to. Point out somebody to me that needs you. And so those are the two things I want to leave you with to think about today. That, guys, we are a Barnabas church. A generous, encouraging church. And through that, the grace of Jesus flows through all of you and flows to everyone out there that needs it. We are an overflow of God's grace because of our encouragement and our generosity. So I'm going to pray for us, and when I pray, we're going to have the band come out, and they're going to lead us in a song. And while they do that, we're going to have prayer partners that come down here on the corners, and they're here because they love you, because they want to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything at all, it could be little, it could be small, it could even be a celebration, come down front and, and get prayer. They're tucked away in the corners so that we don't, you're not going to be highlighted and people are going to be able to see you. And what I can say is there's no magic in these prayers. We're not here to solve your problems. We're not here to cure you. But we're just here to stand with you and to pray with you because we love you, because we know how much Jesus loves you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would take the words that I've said and that you would let it.